Integral Psychology, usually associated with Ken Wilber, who wrote a book by that name, but it's more technically understood as a kind of approach or a type or level of vision that uh, attempts to make an inclusive, integrative, emergent structural model of the multiple dimensions of psychology that need to be taken into account in order to have a coherent understanding of the self and its treatment modalities that doesn't uh, sabotage itself. Amen. That's where Greg comes in. Greg's performed a similar move whereby his attempt to formulate a common structure for the schools of psychology necessitated uh, an emergent stack of general cosmic and individual maturation and interdisciplinary organization. So uh, Greg's one of my favorite people. So is Bruce. We're happy to have them both here today. How are you doing? Uh, thank you so much, Layman. It's great to be here. I love to be hanging out with both of you guys and talk about integral psychotherapy. I'm really psyched. I think the opening question, um, the one that your book on the subject revolves around is, what is psychology? You know, what is it to other than just saying it's the thing between sociology and biology? And in a broader sense, because I'd like to orient this toward treatment modalities as much right. as possible, psychology. What is <laughs> psyche, Greg? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I, I thought I knew what it was as an undergraduate, and then as a graduate training, I realized I didn't know what the F it was. <laughs> so, so, yeah, to, uh, the bottom line is, is that uh, I actually think that the field of psychology can be unified, but actually should be divided conceptually into three broad domains. Two on the science side, that is, is that there's a fundamental when we use the word mental process or behavior and mental process, our field does not know what it's talking about. <laughs> okay. I mean, the, 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 that's like, and then when you really, what do you mean by that? It's like, well, what I mean is there are millions of different mid-level paradigms, uh, you know, just take for the beginning, the term behavior and mental process. We have five to 10% of psychologists that just define psychology as the science of behavior. Okay, that's the classic and rad into radical behavioral position uh, that sort of does not think that the mental is a valid scientific construct. Uh, then you have others that basically will say, hey, psychology is the science of mind or the mind and not even think about it in terms of behavior. Uh, and indeed, you can argue that cognitive science tradition sort of does that. The mainstream definition of the field is the science of behavior and mental process just yokes them together. But actually, if you understand the history, behavior really is defined epistemologically, meaning it's the methods of science that allow us to window into the mind using the language game and processes of science like quantification, observation, integrated reliability. So really behavior is what you extract scientifically as the observable dimension of the mental. But that's a big problem because it still doesn't tell you what mental is, okay? Uh, and, uh, the tree of knowledge gives us a frame, at least, uh, that I think it gives us an ontology of the mental. Uh, and one of the things that it says is that there's really two fundamentally different dimensions to the mental. The animal mental dimension, which is the behavior of the animal as a whole, mediated by nervous system and brain, has it act on the environment, has that uh, nervous system store information. That's what I call mental behavior. And so really basic psychology, in my estimation, should be defined as the science of mental behavior, not behavior and mental process. Um, but mental is a particular kind of behavior that scientists are interested in. And that would be basically across the entire, uh, well, most of the animal kingdom. There are some animals that don't have brains and nervous systems, and so they're at the base. But anywhere from insects to primates is what basic psychology should be concerned with. It used to be that. It used to be it's called comparative psychology. Um, and that didn't one compare to humans. That was like across the world, of animals. Uh, there's some, the mental lives or mental behavior patterns of animals. That's what it should be. And then there should be a separate science called human psychology. That shouldn't be redundant. Uh, the science of human mental behavior, uh, which is a whole other stack because you have the culture person justification and the evolution of culture and the way you get self-recursive thinking and then the intersection with sociology and culture and the so social sciences. So Human psych psych science of psychology should be, from my vantage point, the science of mental behavior. And then there should be a subset of human psychology, which forms the base of the social sciences. Uh, and those are, should be part of our basic scientific enterprise. And finally, uh, not to give a long winded answer, you know, I've obsessed about this for 20 years, so I've got shit to say about it. Um, but finally, that's actually very different than the actual practice. Uh, 
Uh, I, that's my actual training is as a clinician. Um, that's what I would call a psychological doctor. A uh, psychological doctor or health service psychologist is a licensed professional whose training is to cultivate a way of being, a knowledge set, a skill, an attitude to enter into a real world situation and be a psychological healer. Um, and that's a radically different uh, set of knowledge and techniques. So I think the profession of psychology should be a different discipline. So really there are three different disciplines, uh, basic human as on the science side, and then the profession, uh, which operates as psychological doctors. Uh, and if we're talking then psychological therapy, that's of course then uh, the healing craft of, of doing the work of a psychological doctor. Nice. Bruce? Yeah, great to be here. Glad to join in this conversation with you, Greg. And I remember in an earlier conversation, I briefly mentioned Bradford Keeney's take on psychology. Um, he's a family systems therapist and theorist. And uh, he basically decided that there was no science to psychology and to just flip it over and look at it as a the latest in the human folk healing sure. disciplines mm -hmm. would you see your project as uh, one way we can look at it is that he looked at the field and saw the same problem you did and yeah. just gave up and said let's just not try to be that totally. so on the one hand would you say that what you're doing is kind of an answer to him to say yes there can be a science if we get these questions right yeah or so, mm -hmm. i just want to ask you like a, yeah, a so, contrast so, there uh -huh. yeah um or would you say that maybe psychology is kind of a, a inherently a meta-discipline or an integrative discipline where it actually weds the science with the folk traditions yep. in, in a generative way? Right. So I have certainly become ever more convinced uh, the importance of sort of understanding the metaphysical arena language system that you're in and then getting clear about the sort of really the socio-historical contingencies of language uh, so that you can then make claims from within as opposed to without. If we do a Wilbur move, like where are we? Okay. So for someone to come along and say, hey, psychology has been around forever, for example, folk psychology, it overlaps with philosophy. Um, don't try to jam it into some natural science discipline. Let's just take it as it is. We can treat it more as a social inquiry enterprise. We can treat it more as cultivating psychotechnologies. We can see where all the wisdom is in relation. Um, and only an obsessive freak would try to jam it into some science. <laughs> okay. I got a lot of respect for that. I, I can certainly see why that, that would be, uh, there's a lot of wisdom in relationship to that. Um, and so uh, I, I, I wouldn't challenge that path per se. Here was, here's my path in relation. Uh, and that is, is that actually something happened with modern science. Okay, so I'll use the term modern science. That's what happens with Galileo into Newton uh, and the emergence of that kind of epistemology, let's say it's as a contrast to the yogic sciences, if you want to call them sciences, but that's, they have a different epistemology. So something happened with the modern natural science epistemology it comes off a of natural philosophy in the Western Christian tradition. Um, and they learned a particular way to approach nature. Um, and really modern psychology, I would argue, at least you can argue that modern psychology is a very clear identity. That is, um, you know, people talk psyche, people talk things, uh, but in the 19th century, something very clear happened. Modern psychology is, we couldn't decide what psyche was. It has something to do with consciousness, has something to do with mental behavior, there's structural functional elements. It's very clear in the 19th century that people started saying, hey, there's a way we look at stuff scientifically. It's a quantified third person naturalistic view. We can apply that epistemology to the psyche. Okay? Helmholtz, Fechner, these guys early do it. And then Wilhelm Wundt in, the, in 19, 1879 is a father of psychology general. Then William James is going to be the father of American psychology. Okay. Um, I would argue that that's a, that's a discipline, that's a birth of a discipline in a particular way. Uh, so then it becomes formalized. So now to me, the basic argument that I would make is, is that the formal discipline failed to cohere. That's what, that's what I argue the problem of psychology is. Now, then you can then say two things. It was like, it could have never cohered because it asked the wrong kind of question. So it was never the right kind of question. 
And therefore, you would then go to the folk argument and say this was all misguided from the beginning. My solution was actually, no, it never cohered with what I would call then the enlightenment gap. So the enlightenment gap is the term I use. We didn't build the right scientific and philosophical metaphysical systemic structure to make sense out of the world in a way that allows for the scientific epistemology to be then coherently organized. But that was available to us. Like it could have been done. <laughs> if, we had, if we had carved nature at its right joint points, uh, most notably there is a real clear distinction between life into mind or organisms into animal and from animal into people, there are actually joint points. And if you saw joint points that way, we could have then scientifically said, yep, there's basic comparative psychology. It's on par with ethology, the science of animal behavior. And then there's a human psychology that we can put on top of that and really use the same basic natural science language. Now it gets tricky when we get into humans and I can, I can give you my qualifications why I think social science is different than non-human natural science. But there's a natural to into human science continuity that affords a lot more coherence than we were able to achieve. Um, and if you get that, then you can then ground uh, an understanding, scientific understanding into the applied domain. So the real question is, can you do it? They haven't done it. It was a good idea. Maybe we should just give up on it. My answer was actually, you know, that's a nut that can be cracked. <laughs> Uh, it's like that Gandhi quote that Western civilization is a good idea and someone should try it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So unified psychology, I, all right, my, my argument's a good idea. And actually, if you tweak and rotate the vision logic of our understanding in the right way, there's an opportunity for a lot more consilience than people have realized. So I'm really curious about how you organize the, um, the fields of psychology that exist within your notion of human psychology and how those relate to the professional treatment domains, right? Are there sub joint points within human psychology? What are the structures of psyche that give rise to the different modalities of treatment? Totally. Um, so what we have here on the thing behind me, okay, the, the tree behind me, you see there's eight different branches and there's the yellow thing in the middle that ties them all together, but the eight branches. So if you're facing it on the left side of the tree, um, are four different architectures that I argue set the stage for the meta-theoretical synthesis of psychology. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you understand these architectures, we can then assimilate and integrate the key insights from the major paradigms theoretically, okay? That then give rise to both the basic and human psychological structure. All of that was done all, always with the, the reason I got meta-theoretical was because of my work in the clinic room, okay? So just, to, and then I'll get to the fifth branch, which will come back to your question, Lehman. But essentially I got trained in empiricism and I was like, oh, okay, empiricism's the right way to go. People folk bullshit their stuff and we got our, we empiricists need to come in and sort it all out, right? You know, I, I bought that line, okay? Um, and, it's, and narrowly, it still has, I'm, I'm an empiricist narrowly at heart. I mean, you want to apply methods of science, they're brilliant. But the field grossly, it says that that's the solution, except when you then become a practitioner, you then enter the real world, okay? When you enter the real world, then you have a real set of contingencies that are here that you then have to relate to, and everything's up in the air. And the only way to bring the research to the practice is through theory, okay? You need an, a theoretical architecture that then tells you, how do I extract research findings organize that pattern, match it up with a pattern that I see with some degree of coherence, and then bring the intersection of my conceptual understanding to the real here and now, all right? So the argument that I experienced was that, well, the absence of a meta-theoretical coherent architecture main basically meant that if I were gonna be a psychological doctor, I would just be picking and choosing research findings with no coherent way to sort, why would I wait this research finding is crucial relative to this for this particular perspective, okay? So that's the problem. The unified theory says, oh, if you organize a meta-theoretical structure, then this is how you apply it. That's the backdrop. Now let's come to your question, which actually then is the jump from the first four branches onto the right side of the tree. There's the fifth branch, okay? The fifth branch is called character adaptation systems theory, all right? And what it is, is it's a schema of systems of character adaptation, okay? It argues that when we look at somebody, we're gonna look at them through 
three different layer contexts. One is the biological vector context. So this is from uh, conception through your, as an organism sitting in this chair, that's your biological vector, the bio. Then there's the learning and developmental context, which is at the level of the individual since you were born, what have you, each of us dealt with on our own learning and developmental trajectory? Like what have been the major impact events and where are we developmentally and what has been the sequence of the group? This is your psycho history, okay? And then finally, there's the socio-cultural historical context, which is where were you born, okay? From a, Ron Brenner has what are called socio-ecological Layer. So what's, what family are you born in? That's your micro context. What community are you born in? That's the meso context. And what's the macro? I'm a white man, or I'm not born, but <laughs> white boy in, a, in Northern Virginia. Okay, so there you go. That's the macro. So these are your biopsychosocial contexts, which virtually everybody would agree. Uh, in fact, APA the training to become licensed as psychological doctors tests you and say, if you be a accredited program, you have to have biological, psychological, and social influences. The problem, as I would say, is actually nobody really knows what those vectors are and why. They mean them very differently. Well, the unified theory, like with the tree of knowledge, tells you what those vectors are, okay? They're different information uh, communication processing systems that operate at different nested hierarchical levels. So that gets clear. And that, so now you have a, what I call the vertical integration that gets clear there. And then you bring it into the individual. So now what I look at are five systems of character adaptation, okay? The systems of character adaptation are the processes by which an individual, to use John Verveke's term, the agent arena relationship that then gets stacked over various hierarchical levels of neurocognitive processes and consciousness, okay? This will get back to then your question. So what's the first layer? The first layer is what I call the habit system layer, all right? So the habit system layer is the way the nervous system processes information, like becomes sensitized or habituated to particular kinds of systems, and then cultivates procedural learning in basically a dynamic cyclical context. What I mean by that is like, you'll learn to eat under certain circumstances across biological time. You'll learn to sleep in certain ways. And this will create an embedded lifestyle pattern of your habits, okay? And it will prime the base by which you respond to stimuli or habituate to stimuli, okay? And it also affords you your basic procedural patterns that are available. And by the way, this is the least or the most distant from our conscious reflective awareness. So it's habits, okay? Habits and lifestyle or the habit system. The next system is the base of your consciousness system it's called the experiential system. The experiential system sits on valence qualia, which is positive and negative, active, passive, okay? It grounds you into your body in the dynamic participatory relationship that you feel, okay? As to whether things are good or not, the propositional valence qualia. <laughs> I mean, prepositional valence qualia, okay? And that system then grows into the more complicated affective constellations of sadness or grief, or depression if it's over a mood kind of structure. So that experiential system is a perceptual system, a motivational system, an emotional system that's guiding you, okay? That's the experiential system. Then you jump up the next level to the relationship system. The relationship system is grounded in your early development of attachment, which will lay the architecture of self-other, okay? Whether you had a secure attachment or an insecure attachment and how that structured you. It also then channels whatever your interpersonal tendencies are like. You've heard of trait agreeableness. People that are trait agreeableness want to go along, get along. The disagreeableness will be competitive, irritable, okay? Disagreeable, <laughs> who would have thunk it, all right? Uh, and then it also tracks your sense of whether or not you have relational value and social influence and whether in relation you're dynamically feeling competitive, cooperative, meshed or distant, okay? And it maps that. So your relationship system really is your internal working models, how you then sit into dyads and triads, how you place yourself in the social field. And by the way, it's all initially grounded in intuition, perception, motivation. I mean, it's not linguistic. We share this with our primate world, okay? The next two are more human, all right? I'll jump up to the last one. That's the justification system, okay? This is the verbally mediated 
narrating self-conscious reason giving system uh, that in from a cognitive perspective, it says, hey, what are your automatic thoughts? I mean, traditional cognitive perspective, like how do you justify, attribute, interpret these kinds of issues and explain why you're doing what you're doing? From a narrative or existential perspective, this also is generally where your philosophy of living is, okay, how you think about the world, uh, your large scale sense making, what you identify with in terms of say your religion, things like that. And the one I skipped over is the defensive system. So the defensive system is the process for sort of your psychological immune system. It's trying to maintain awareness of threat and then reacting to threat to protect yourself. It's also at least in the short term trying to create um, coherent integration between domains across time. Although what will happen is if it gets triggered in maladaptive defenses, then all of a sudden you'll, you'll see uh, your processes can get uh, structured in a particular way that gets you more and more rigid, fragile, and vulnerable. Okay? So to go back through, you have the three systems, biopsychosocial of context, and then five systems of adaptation, habit, experiential, relationship, defense, and justification. Okay. So now it's a long-winded backdrop answer to get back to your question be like, well, how the hell do these damn systems go together? Okay, as paradigms of psychotherapy. Well, I'm focused right now on individual level psychotherapy. In individual level psychotherapy, classic mainstream American psychotherapy, there are four individual level approaches uh, that are dominant. One's behavioral, okay, the behavioral tradition. It then gives rise to or is associated with a cognitive tradition. Okay, you get then now you get these yoked together, but they are different. You get a cognitive behavioral tradition. There's also a historical experiential tradition that also overlaps with the humanistic tradition. And in modern day time, it's been yoked together in what's called emotion focused therapy. And there's the psychoanalytic into psychodynamic tradition. Okay, so cognitive, behavioral, humanistic, emotion, uh, experiential, and psychodynamic. Those are the big four. Okay. There are others, but really variants of other of these at the individual level. Now, group level, there's systems, family systems views, but these are very powerful for the big. Now let's align them with the systems of adaptation. So you have it system, okay? Sort of non-thinking habit system. What's triggered by the environment? What elicits a procedural response? What consequences does it have? You know, basically the behavioral frame of reference corresponds very strongly to habits, lifestyles, and the environment sort of non-conscious agent and reading and exchange. The humanistic emotion focuses, focuses on the emotional side of the experiential system, how it's grounded in the body, detecting whether or not it's safe, what can grow in relation, and how do we tend to adaptive versus maladaptive emotional process. The psychodynamic tradition now focuses on the attachment relationship system at its core and the processes of psychodynamic defense, which are basically the categories in the way the system try to organize this. And then the cognitive tradition focuses on more or less the here and now interpretive justifying systems and the narrative and existential traditions, um, which are, you can place them in different ways, but they also fit in the, in the cognitive. Okay. So now what you get is you get a human psychological science with the other four branches of the tree and now return to the individual level psychotherapy systems and say, rather than commit yourself to gurus and paradigms, you know, um, and I, you know, I love him, God love him, but really Beck is a guru paradigm guy. I mean, you go, you learn cognitive therapy and you pray to the God of cognitive therapy and you horse race that against the crazy psychoanalytic view, which he used to be, <laughs> okay? That's the way you get trained. This says no way, these things are actually systems of adaptation and it would be as silly to focus on just the cognitive view as if we drop into medicine and say, all health is due to your gastrointestinal functioning. <laughs> It's like that's, you know, that's one system and, and your physiology, those are specialists. You can look at the system that way. You can learn how it functions. The overall system is a, is a health system. Uh, you're functioning biologically that way. You know, the question is how do these systems of adaptation that the different paradigms have honed in on, how do they get harmonized? That's why I'm for seeing the elephant rather than racing horses. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I really appreciated that. And even before you got to where the different disciplines plug in, I could already, you just des described each of the modes of adaptation well enough that, you know, we can intuit what domain is going to fit where. Um, so I think that's really dynamic and, and inclusive approach. And I wanted to ask you, um, it wasn't based on that question, but I wanted to ask you 
kind of a two-pronged question about eco-psychology. Ah. And one, there's a claim in eco-psychology that ultimately we can't be fully humanly healthy if we don't have a right living relationship with our biosphere. Yep. Um, and so I'm, on the one hand, I'm curious if you see clinical and, and scientific theoretical evidence for that, mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a politics or a theology kind of creeping into psychology? Or do you see in your own research that there, there is something, you know, to that claim that we really, we do need in our full wise human functioning, a living relationship with a greater than human world, and that therefore there would be a role for eco psychology. And then two, assuming that you said yes to the latter, you know, and I don't know that that's really a given, but assuming that you did, then where would you um, want to situate that in um, the schemas that you've developed? Sure. Okay. So um, remember I said you're putting context and I talk about socio-ecological context. I emphasize the relational human aspects of that ecology. Okay. But there are also technological and biophysical aspects of that. If you really do a proper contextualization, you have a socio-ecological there's the justification and relationship systems that you're a part of. There's the buildings and the human technological civilization elements that we're surrounded in, and ultimately you're nested in a biophysical ecology. Okay. So the health of that ecology, well, you know, if you're in Detroit, Michigan and you're drinking lots of lead <laughs> at one basic level, that can have a huge impact, right? So we can totally agree on simple levels of toxins, noise, all of that stuff. Um, that's so clearly. Um, that is a layer of consideration, um, you know, depending on how alarmist we get about our relationship with the planet and what we're able to do. Obviously, we were dependent completely upon the planet at some level for a resource flow. If we, uh, you know, if we pollute the planet and we extract all of its minerals and don't put any back, we will kill the tree that we're living off of. Um, so that's unbelievably important also. So an eco, a weak version of eco-psychology is already built into the system at that level. In other words, there's a clear attentiveness to that. Um, I would then go further than that and endorse a somewhat stronger version, and, but not necessarily a full strong version. It depends on, as always the case. My general default is the weak versions of shit is right. <laughs> the extreme strong, probably not. Um, and then how do you put them together with other weak claims? That's a basic rule of thumb. So here's what I would say in relationship to the, I believe that we are seeing a meaning and mental health crisis, okay? Despite the fact that we have more biophysical control over the planet, and I said over the planet, okay? Uh, more biophysical control, we are feeling, I would argue, our souls are uh, less nourished, okay? I think most of that is because of the human relational context. I think that to the extent that we feel known and valued in human relations, that's a huge chunk of our soul. However, I also feel that a substantial minority of that is our detachment with nature, our, our sense to see ourselves above nature, our control of the nature, a sense of alienation from nature, as opposed to a deep woven appreciation of nature and our place in it. Um, and when I talk about sort of metamodernism or a metamodernity sensibility like Lean Rachel Anderson, one of those sensibilities that they really emphasize this, I like this better than Wilbur's stuff, is the oral indigenous sensibility, you know, uh, the felt sense of being in, uh, brothers in nature, <laughs> not over manipulating, controlling nature, but brothers and sisters, uh, communities in nature. We don't do nearly enough of that. Um, and I think that there's certainly some evidence, empirical evidence for nature programs that are fulfilling for individuals in a wide variety of different ways. Um, I wouldn't want to overshoot those claims, but I think they're real. Um, and I think overall, I think we've become technologically bubbled outside of nature and that alienates us from a key part of um, our historical roots. And I wish we would get back uh, to nature. The garden is certainly named with some of that uh, in mind. How do you, um, let's say even clinically in practice, um, negotiate what's biological and what's psychological in the sense of, uh, 
you know, maybe when I'm menstruating, my relationship mode goes astray. Or maybe when I didn't get enough potassium, I start telling myself self-destructive narratives. Or like, yeah. how do we figure out whether it's something we have to look at psychodynamically uh, or whether it might just be a byproduct of biological phenomena? Totally. So these are nested cybernetic feedback loops, okay? Uh, so if you're, if you're sailing a ship on, a, on an ocean, there are lots of different things that cause it to go in various ways. Obviously, if there's a gigantic hole, hole in the hull, <laughs> you know, and that would be the metaphor then of a broken biology. So, there, so um, you know, for me, disease is the combination of a malfunctioning biology um, that then causes harm. To understand that, you have to have to have a general theoretical understanding of what the biological architect, functional structural architecture of that system is. There'll be degrees of deviation, but that gives you a model for thinking about biological malfunction. Okay, and serious biological malfunction then will have downstream consequences on all your psychological function. I'm a naturalist, so I believe that certainly every psychological thought that I have is mediated at some level and grounded at some level in my neurobiology, okay? Eliminate my neurobiology, you eliminate me. Um, at least at my active self, you, I'll, leave, I'll leave podcasts <laughs> behind, but, <laughs> okay? So, so there's the, so, but then the issue is that the reason it's called character adaptation systems theory is the argument basically that the, that the systems of be, I call it a behavioral investment system Okay, this mental behavioral investment system. And what it is doing at various time scales and various motives with various resources that are available, with various histories, is trying to adapt and adjust. Okay. The general psychological problem is maladaptive cycles of adjustment. Okay. So that means is that the behavioral investment pattern, all of the systems themselves are functioning based on the expected structural functional response that would make sense, okay? But at the same time, what you can then understand is, oh, well, if you do this, okay, then you're gonna have serious problems. And if those things make sense, then I don't need to drop into biological trouble, okay? And one way to think about these things, or at least I will often do this with, you can see this like with internal family systems or all of the very psychodynamic transactional models, there are good reasons to think about these as sub-personalities, okay? If you think about them as subpersonalities, then you can reify them and imagine them as a family. Okay. If you go into a family and you have a drunken father and a timid, abused mother and kids that are screaming, you don't go in and go, God, there's a lot of biological dysfunction here, isn't there? <laughs> you know, you just see families that do not get along. Okay. And, and what's available to you is, oh, God, there's no loving reciprocity between these systems. And then there's a lot of dysfunctional distress that's associated with the failure of a disintegrated and conflictual system. So my basic lens is, hey, is there a lot of maladaptive, you know, based on my theory about the way these systems of adaptation work, is there a lot of maladaptive conflict? And is the level of distress and dysfunction accountable for that kind of, if so, then I'm like, yeah, let's talk, okay? If, you know, six months ago, here we have somebody, you know, who's 22 and they were, everything was fine. And now they're collecting garbage, wondering whether or not aliens are beaming things into their head and they've got a tin hat on. I'm thinking, okay, you know, uh, the, my characteristic adaptation system model didn't say that. We might really have had a schizophrenic breakdown here. And the communication patterns are such that their map of reality is really out of whack and a psychotic condition that would happen, manifest itself like that, I would drop in and start saying, oh, there's probably neurobiological misfirings here that would help me explain this kind of pattern um, much more readily than you know, neurotic conflict. Your um, answer there anticipated the kind of next question I wanted to ask, so feels like the exactly the right flow here for me. Uh -huh. um, I've been enjoying your conversation with, uh, John Verveke and Christopher on the elusive eye and uh, the nature of the self. And I was thinking about internal family systems, but also something like um, dissociative identity disorder. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of a two prong question I have again. The first one is very easy. I'll ask that one, then I'll, I'll do a little follow up to it. Um, 
basically the first question is, in my understanding, and I'll, I'll you know, like to hear your take on the validity of that, but I've heard and read a number of studies where it seems that when people are in their altars, uh, not only does their perception and behavior change, but even physiologically, they undergo some changes. Um, their blood okay. pressure might change. They might have different vision capacity, different things physically will change for them. And so considering that and considering the question that you're exploring in the elusive eye, what do you think dissociative identity disorder says about the reality of the self? Ah. <laughs> An easy question. Uh, no. no, actually, I think it's a brutal. I have worked with somebody that had a genuine DID as a clinician. They're pretty rare, but they're real. Um, and um, hell of a story, as is almost always the case, had exactly the kind of, um, actually, I got a little vicarious trauma based on, as we read her trauma work, torture trauma history, that kind of unbelievable brutality and um, manifest in ways. So I've seen this up close. It's a real thing. It's pretty intense. And, you know, let me first say that if I'm just working off my model and somebody says, hey, this is what happens to people. Uh, and this is what they do. Does that make sense? I was like, oh, that's kind of confusing. So let's be clear about when your model predicts stuff as opposed to when you're after the fact trying to make sense out of it and explaining it. I'm not alone in that. I don't know that too many standard models say, oh, this is exactly what happens when and why. And now we can explain this with ease. And it's like, no, okay. But there definitely are ways to frame it. Um, I absolutely believe that there are essentially the self model becomes an organizing, centralizing, cybernetic system, okay, that activates memory, that activates motivation. We all, uh, the blog I did on the self is, you know, uh, one self or many selves, okay, um, and the answer is both, <laughs> both and, the unity and multiplicity. Um, every one of us, I'm sure, can, rec and if you couldn't, you wouldn't be a functional person, you know, you're in a totally different mode uh, Friday night, evening, late at night with your wife or as a professor in the middle of the day on a Wednesday. You know, you feel different things, you see different things, uh, you think in different ways. So different context activates very different aspects in, of the self. Uh, and that has to be the case for our own uh, experience. If you then move to individuals that start to have really strong defenses and engage in what we would call neurotic into borderline splitting, okay, um, you really see individuals who have trauma histories, who have parts of themselves that are poorly integrated. You see that differentiation uh, that's fine-grained and adaptive in, in, in all high-functioning individuals to then get really pulled and conflicted and be dramatic and erratic um, so that the identity of who they are and where they are, and what's going on and what they believe is really strikingly different. Um, I certainly believe my model is very, uh, in fact, my current doc doctoral student is uh, getting ready to defend her dissertation next one, and that is applying uh, the unified theory to understand borderline personality and the borderline construct. So it's a it's analysis of that. Um, and those of you who know borderline, it's a real identity disturbance with really extreme elements. Um, and then that gets us into DID, dissociative identity disorder, it used to be multiple personality disorders, which I would argue that virtually everybody that would meet criteria that I'm aware of of DID would also be in the borderline personality disorder care, probably. Um, maybe some exceptions to that, but that would be the majority. So then what do we imagine that's happening in relationship to this? Well, the standard frame of reference um, is that a massive trauma sets the stage for a dissociative uh, defense. And we see this all the time. Uh, when you get traumatized in a particular way, um, Actually, it's in your nervous system. You have opponent processing systems in your uh, in the back of your spine, so that if if your sharp bites onto your a lot of people, some people experience the agony, but a huge number of people are like I didn't feel a thing. It took my whole leg off, and I got nothing. What happened? Well, actually, the system has defenses in it, opponent processing defenses. And when it gets that large of signal, it's designed to cut off, so the system doesn't go into panic and insane mode, and actually then tries to. So if we agree that there are clearly dissociative defenses that allow to downregulate and allow you to move, remove yourself, and then you get somebody who's experiencing trauma, then the idea that they would create a disconnect between some aspects of themselves, some modes of being that are dark and traumatic and horrifying that are 
both maybe identifying with the perpetrator or maybe they're in a childlike element that's unbelievably abused by it. There's then a dissociative sort of quasi healthy individual that's really unplugged from that. These are not uncommon alters, by the way, to kind of see um, that you would get extreme differentiation of mode that are so heavily defended against the schematic cluster of organization um, that they do not have contact with each other. You know, I mean, hell, some people think the universe has got multiple universes in it, you know, well, maybe got multiple cells, you know, that have no contact, you know. And then the argument would be, yeah, there would be some frequency of organization around memory, mode, all of that, that clusters itself together with a particular thing that then is separated out from a shared space. Uh, that would then require a trigger and then it's got so much of a differentiation and defense which again these are i'm doing i'm moving my hands here people <laughs> that's because i'm waving my hands um it's really you know it's a very complicated thing but i think the structural functional description of it um can at least bring some light to it and see yep no this is at least some understanding about how this might uh how the borderline propensity for defense which i think is very easy well, not very easy, but it's easy to understand given the architect, structural architecture of operating. In extreme cases, gives rise to a dissociative identity. Um, I certainly believe that's absolutely true. I think they're documented. I've seen it up, up front. They're not just like faking it by any stretch. Um, and it's a, it's a tragic and fascinating phenomenon. It, says, uh, it certainly says, I think, a lot of things about the self. Like when you say there is no such thing as a self, it's like, well, these, I mean, yes, that says it's both fragmented, but man, these have different selves inside of them and they organize the entire physiological structure. It's like the self gets activated and then it mirrors a totally different signature into physiology. And yeah, you have even allergies in different ways. Some people are left-handed, I haven't seen that, but, uh, but I certainly, the person I saw talked differently, acted differently, didn't remember anything in relation um, and, and had a very, very different feel in the room. That's for sure when she was in one altar. The uh, extreme cases of dissociation make me very curious about more mild, regular forms of dissociation that might go on in everybody. And that seems to be a topic that's midway between the singular plural discussion about the psyche and the question of consciousness and unconsciousness. Because yeah. when we look at singularity and plurality, we could say, well, maybe I'm born plural and I have to unify myself. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm born plural and I have to embrace my plurality and have a healthy team inside. Okay. Or maybe I was born unified and something happens. I broke down. I, I, parts of me got fragmented. Yeah. And so likewise, there are a lot of systems that are unconscious by their very nature. There's a lot of things that we can develop to be conscious of but it seems like there's some parts of ourselves that we could or should be conscious of and things go wrong and we put them aside or hide them somewhere or repurpose their meaning so that we approach them wrongly um, what's your take on how fragmentation occurs and what is the general um, methodological approach to healing fragmentation or to reintegrating elements of the self that should be conscious yeah um a wonderful, rich question. It's not surprising from you guys, wonderful, <laughs> rich question. Um, so a couple of things. I think that the base of the experiential system has different modes of operating that then are activating associated with particular kinds of action selection sequence, different kinds of at least memory types of activation. So for example, if you're in an excited desire state, okay, the body wants access to action selection and memory in a different than if you're in a shutdown depressed state. All right. So you are going to see different modes of being that are going to then be, and some people use the word split psychodynamically. Oh, that's a split defense. And often I'm like, well, it's often a fracture, okay, of modes of being. And so you have, you know, you, oh, they idealize and then they, you know, uh, diminish. It's like, well, that might be the case. And I'll get into then what I think are some of the defenses that then give it, but it also could be the base organization of the experiential system. Okay. And many individuals, then I think you get into what are called, what I would call sort of dichotomizing polarized process as opposed to healthy opponent process, okay? Healthy opponent process is, hey, I want to be approaching and avoiding in proper dynamic relation because I need them both, you know? Uh, I want to both be rigidly controlled on the one hand to manage order and I want to be exploring on another. That's, that's a, a healthy balance between those types of things are 
modes or, or when the system is coherently integrating and listening to different parts. But you can easily imagine how you see systems that are in fluctuating defensive, like Google, all, all pain depressive shutdown, okay? Or then get activated and be all manicky, of course, bipolar, right? Or be unbelievably rigid over here and then be risky and compulsive, you know, impulsive over here, all right? Um, so there are ways in which the system can fragment and be erratic as opposed to systems that are engaged in healthy, ad dynamic, adaptive opponent process when the strengths of one side are holding the strengths of another. Um, so the idea that you would have a multiplicity of different systems that get activated in vision ways and that they would pull against one another to me is essentially the model that I'm walking around with of the primate self, okay? So now let me go into then what happens with the person side of the equation, okay? So my argument basically is, is that, well, we, we get synced up, okay? Uh, and the first thing that we get synced, we hit hominids in particular, but this is true of other social animals, we get synced up in the relational space, all right? And what I'm tracking there from the influence matrix perspective is what's my relational value and my sense of security, okay? On the one hand, that's my, hey, I'm safe and I'm good versus, hey, this is dangerous and I might be vulnerable. Okay. I would argue our polyvagal nervous system actually is really organized as a base. And we have two modes of operating. One is you can feel it in a room. You just walk in, up, oh, people are talking shit. <laughs> it's like, whoa, you know, your body gets tense. You get a little back, you get more calm. All of a sudden you're self-conscious about what you say and what you feel, okay? So, so you're gonna get organized there and that will be one mode you'll be your relaxed mode. Notice then these are, well, what, what, what are you? It's like, well, it depends on the context, right? But I have access to both of these so they, and they can sometimes push against one another. Now let's get into this idea that what happens on top of that primate system is a personal justifying system, okay? That learns what is, what is and ought to be from explicit narrative and also has a unique perspective on the private inner thoughts relative to the public world, okay? So now, you know, you learn, oh my gosh, I mean, one of the things I, it's sort of a classic scenario on this, but this is, um, you know, this has happened to my friend. So when we were growing up, uh, I don't think I've told you guys this story of this, but I've sold several, so if I report repeated this, sorry, you know, um, we weren't completely homophobic, but we were not sensitive to the LGBT community in the 1980s as we are now, right? You know, so we would say, we joke around. I had a friend, you know, um, who was connected to people uh, and we would hang around. We talk about dating. I talk about my dating failures <laughs> and other people would talk about dating successes, but, but he would just nod along, okay? Um, and then over time, what happened, okay, was that he sort of in college woke up and came out to himself first for, you know, a couple of months to a year, I'm not sure exactly, and then came out of the closet. All right, so if you talk to him about where he thought he was at 16 or 17, he just thought he had low sex drive. He didn't realize that he was gay, except in retrospect. So how do we understand that? Well, we understand that he would have homosexual inclinations at the energy level, okay? That would jolt images of homosexual activity that his en energy or emotional system would be moving toward, okay? But that would then come on to the public stage imagery that you would act on and the self-conscious narrator would say, oh my God, All right? That's trouble at various levels of consciousness. Really this, this just gets signaled and then, be in, and then the system would say, don't look at that, that's not you, okay? That's not you. And so really even before you're conscious of it, a justification would come in and say, this is not okay, okay? And then where does that go? Well, it goes in the shadow of the, of the consciousness. The system is there, but now it's get tagged with a secondary anxiety. And the person then is defended against it, okay? So then the idea, whatever would happen if they got exposed to homoerotic material, they could be, you know, all sorts of things. Classically, you can then get a reaction formation where the person says, I hate all homosexual bacteria. We, we saw in the 1980s, we saw a lot of, you know, like preachers all of a sudden coming out as gay, you know? <laughs> it's like, well, what's going on there? Well, the argument could be that they develop a justification narrative, you know, that's for their public cells and everything. And I hate this and I hate this. Why? Because this thing emerges subconsciously and then they have to get rid of it. But of course, now you have the part of yourself that's driven in one way and a whole justification self-consciousness that's in the other way. 
Um, I call this the Freudian filter, obviously with a nod to Freud that says you have to be publicly justifying your action in one way, and then you're going to regulate your internal motives and desires and feelings a particular way to stay, maintain your rationalized self. Well, the physio biophysiological system doesn't operate that way. <laughs> so, so, you know, you're in conflict and then you jam stuff into the closet of your psyche. Uh, and that's your shadow and at least the dark shadow is the, the long stand of what's unjustifiable. It's the kind of stuff that you fear that you are, but hope that you're not, um, but you don't have much access to. So that can give rise to a, a very uh, sort of distinct fragmented sense of self in relation. Layman's question basically anticipated or, or framed what I was thinking also in, in terms of asking about how the different sub-personalities are related to. Uh, I know Asa Joli, who was the originator of the concept of sub-personality, uh, he first thought that the aim of his approach, which was psychosynthesis beyond the analysis, was then the synthesis that was needed, is that the different sub-personalities need to be synthesized together into one functional whole. But as he you know, progressed in his own work, and I think his own community progressed, it moved to a different position where it's not necessary in their view now to bring them all into one unified structure. As long as there is, you could say, the agentic center, which is able to hold all of them mutually in love um, without necessarily integrating them, um, into one functional center, um, but to allow them multiplistically to thrive within a field of, of love or acceptance. Um, and I think that, you know, part of that coming out process is expanding this arena where you can hold parts of yourself in love um, where before you needed to be splitting them. Totally, um, totally. One thing I wanted to ask about, I received my training in marriage and family therapy, but also transpersonal ah. counseling psychology. Okay, yeah. And the APA, of course, barely acknowledges the existence of, much less the validity of transpersonal psychology. <laughs> um, although, you know, some transpersonal psychologists consider themselves the fourth force or the fifth force of psychology. But although, you know, there are transpersonal psychologists who have, through their work, actually uh, changed some of the content of the DSM. Mm -hmm. So they are engaging with the field in a way that's actually generating changes in the overall field of practice that everybody will come across, whether they're recognizing the validity of the field or not. Uh, but I wanted to ask you your take on basically the transpersonal domains without necessarily needing to move in any kind of uh, metaphysical spiritual direction, sure. but within a naturalistic frame that you've developed and the orientation towards wisdom, how would you relate to transfer personal phenomena, experiences of tr self transcendence and working with that constructively and healthily? Beautiful. Well, let, me, let me go back. First, I'll just say that I, um, I think it's actually a very meta modern place to think about sort of an integrated pluralistic view of self. Okay. Uh, and this idea to hold both the coherent integrative agentic center at the one hand, but appreciate the multiplicity of self. In fact, I have a little symbol, as you know, called the I-quad coin. And that really just captures the idea that, that one of the key tasks of self is unity, multiplicity, dialectic. Um, and anything that would be, you know, extreme, you know, dissociative identities, <laughs> it's gonna be a little too much on the multiplicity side, <laughs> clearly. But anything that would be rigidly singular at the level of self, I think would be really problematic. So, um, so at a basic level, coherent integration across the multiplicity of subpersonalities give rise to some, you know, rainbow, but, you know, of form uh, that has some degree of, uh, but lots of both flexibility and unity uh, sort of in appropriate dialectic. So there's that point that I just like to make in terms of what I think is healthy um, and where my system would lead. The second thing is, is that, you know, we did, you know, the field of, of American psychology doesn't, uh, doesn't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's one thing that it is, it's committed to empiricism. That's what it tries to, at least to the extent that it's scientific. Um, so we got lots of physics envy. <laughs> like, oh God, we're feeling kind of small down here, boys. Okay, so let's at least be scientific for the love of God, right? Um, no pun intended, all right? So anything that then smacks of spiritualism uh, and non-naturalistic approaches, you know, through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, 
and let's face it, some of the stuff goes pretty far off, you know. Um, so the system has no idea how to regulate that um, and be in proper relation. As you could both know, being wonderful guests on my You Talking with Greg podcast, right? My whole frame is that, oh my God, we need a coherent naturalistic ontology that can revitalize the human soul and spirit. Okay. Um, we have been horribly, we, we adopted the, you know, sort of Dawkins esque atheistic version of reality that said, oh, well, the concrete versions of Christianity aren't true. Ergo, all religions are foolish. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, not ergo. <laughs> no. Um, and so the uh, idea of the spiritual dimension of humanity uh, is absolutely something we need to you know, reflect on. When I do my psychological approach to mindfulness, this calm MO, it's an integrated approach to psychological mindfulness. Um, I just differentiate uh, psychological mindfulness from meditative mindfulness. Okay. Meditative mindfulness gets the, you know, to use John for Vakey's term, the, the um, adverbial witness function, that's where it's focused on. How do you cultivate that? How do you draw attention to it? Um, how do you maintain sort of detached mastery from uh, your perspectival knower? Uh, and, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And meditation teaches you how to do that. And I'm underdeveloped in that regard. Um, but I'm well-developed in what I would call psychological mindfulness. And that's through the sage narrator perspective. So the sage narrator comes in and says, hey, how would we then engage in, well, that's what talk therapy is. How would we then talk this through and create the right kind of context? And when I do calm, I do calm body, okay? Cause that's basically through the experiential system into the body, down into habit system, what's my felt, pus negative, what's my body position. Then I come into calm heart, that's that emotion into experiential system into the relationship system. Like where am I feeling? Am I feeling attached and loved? What's my polyvagal? Where am I in terms of that? Then calm mind, really mind three, what's my justification system? Okay. And then finally calm spirit. Am I in right relation to whatever I see is above me? Okay. Trans my person, right? Whatever's above me, um, whatever the fundamental value structures that I have that extend beyond my egoic concerns and place me in proper relation to the universe above my ego. Um, and uh, so to me, the idea that that is a crucial aspect of our structure, the idea that we have a value-based notion along those lines, if you didn't, I mean, all if you had was an ego, then, you know, screw everybody else. <laughs> I mean, you know, where does morality come from? Where do, we, where do we, you know, we want to be a good ancestor. All of the basic things that connect us to larger humanity and the planet. Um, to me, is properly conceived of as transcendent spiritual concerns. Uh, and I believe that crystal clear, healthy humans and healthy humans in, on earth and in context with each other have some clear sense of that moral, spiritual world. Um, so, you know, there are ontological questions, yes, but the basic thrust of, the, of a transpersonal view and that we seek right alignment with some spiritual calling is to me just basic. And uh, it's a shame that that is lost on the APA. <laughs> I'm really curious about the potential for structures emerging around our encounter with whatever we experience as transcending us. Hmm. Right. So you have these five levels and I was particularly keyed into the justification level. It's interesting to think of it as having kind of a bottom floor where uh -huh. something's unjustified about myself. So I drop it into the defense zone. Mm -hmm. But at the top, maybe I'm super justified. Maybe I create a tautological loop of self-justification, which passes as an overflowing faithfulness. So that's one way that something yeah. spiritual could look structurally in this map. Another one sure. is to say, well, maybe there's a, a sixth zone of psychology that's slowly emerging. And we don't just encounter a nebulous transcendence, but our interaction with that is leading something new to build up in us. Sure. And then also you put the sociological on the other side of the psychological. Right. So how much of the spiritual is really the um, higher or deeper relational dimension that we often ascribe to culture? Totally. I mean, my basic look on, I, I'd look at this from a number of different developmental, I mean, you take an integral perspective, okay? Or, or take a Confucian perspective from, from China. They both will say, okay, so the system, you grow up, 
you know, you're pre-rational at first as a kid, you're running around emotionally, <laughs> you know, you all of a sudden start learning to talk and mom and dad give you rules and you think of them as God and you just do what they say, right? And you become a little conventional person and you're not thinking about it unless you're really spiritually precocious. You're not thinking, you know, hey, that's what we are and that's what it is, right? And then all of a sudden you get into adolescence and you, and you start to solidify your own egoic development relationship to mom and dad, okay? And you have some recognition that you're a conventional person and you start to wonder some about that. Okay. Now, unfortunately, I would argue that the modernist view, at least a modernist capital industrial view, essentially short circuits the process there. Like, yep, go out and get a job, make as much money as you can, die with as many things that you can leave your kids. Like, you know, that's, and that's where the spiritual impoverishment is. Okay. But virtually every wisdom tradition would then recognize when all the wisdom traditions at least look at the self at the egoic level as limited, you know, fundamentally. And then what does it do? It says, well, if you have this capacity, which is, thank God we humans have this capacity for multiple perspective taking. In fact, this is one of our things that makes our cognition, pre-linguistic cognition, really powerful. It's like, I can imagine what the world looks like from your perspective and Bruce's perspective and other people's perspective. Okay? and then wonder what would be legitimate, you know, in either perspectival or propositional way from other perspectives. Well, if you just apply that basic frame of reference, what you will arrive at naturally is you get further and further zoomed out perspectives at the very least, All right? So you then start to say, well, it's legitimate for me and my family. Well, wait a minute, what about Joe's family <laughs> and, and his wife and their family? And I was like, okay, well, it's legitimate for us United States people, you know, we're like, damn, you know, God, guns and country. Okay. And I was like, well, I was like, okay, but you know, they have their perspective over there. You grow up in China, you grow up in Korea, you grow up in Africa, you're going to have your own particular, you know, perspectives. So every mature physician then drops into various perspectives and at least starts at a very minimum level, starts asking, well, what would be a generalizable perspective? So from my vantage point is that's a natural aspect of development that becomes post-conventional. You can run that up a Keegan poll, you run it up a Wilbur poll, you run it up a moral Confucian poll or, or whatever, or, or a no self poll in relationship to, all of them are about zooming back and realizing a frame of reference that is far above the ego. Uh, I think we carry that potential. I think from a societal perspective, it's crucial that we develop that potential. Um, and more so than ever now that we're on this global society, we try to all got to get along. So I absolutely see, I'd frame it slightly different than a, like a sixth system of adaptation. I would see it as the development of identity, egoic identity, and then the egoic identity trail basically follows, put it in an Ill, integral term, you can just follow it up the stages if you want to put it in that. Yeah, speaking about perspectives, I was thinking about what your what your own experience has been of your work theoretically folding back and influencing your clinical work in integral theory and integral psychotherapy. Of course, it's given a kind of a broad meta frame, but it's also led to some changes in practice in uh, intake, patient intake. We're going to be talking to Andre Marquis Hey, Andrew. Later. Yeah, right. <laughs> Beautiful. And of yeah. course, you know, he's developed the, the wonderful integral intake. Of yeah. um, and Elliot Ingersoll, we might be talking to him. Oh, good. He uses perspectives, you know, kind of a, a perspectival uh, yoga. He wouldn't use that word, but using it to basically identify dissociations, defenses, fixations uh, by how the perspectives are showing up in language. You know, so there are different parts of the integral map that are entering the room in a sense. So have you found um, that your, your you talk uh, has influenced, you know, recursively your own practice? Of course, it's grown out of your practice, but has it sure. yeah, Absolutely. folded back? Right. Yeah, completely. Yeah. So really the development of it is, um, you know, I enter practice. Uh, I can't get coherence. Uh, I then sort of shift over back into cohere, you know, trying to find theoretical coherence. 1997, you know, really up into 2008 is sort of like, that's my task, getting theoretical coherence, solving a unified theory of psychology. I write that book. 
but it's also the case that I'm, you know, I'm directing a doctoral level program. My day job is training psychological doctors. I do it in the clinic room. I do it in the, the, ther uh, the classroom, uh, do it as a program level, uh, ma manage it in relationship to the American psychological uh, accreditation system. So it's a, and then there's constant iterative processes about what needs to happen. And indeed, quite frankly, my early uh, approach, I was so obsessed with the abstractions that, uh, that it, um, especially in the classroom, people would be, feel the distance between that. And then it was always much better when we moved into the clinic room where they'd have a real client. <laughs> and I would say, oh, okay, well, here's their justification. Here's their attachment system. These are the habits that they get for safety behaviors, but now this drive them in a particular way. And they're like, oh, that's how it all goes together. I'm like, I didn't get that when I was taking notes. It's like, well, you know, it's like, um, yeah. So, so there's that. What happened to me then from 2011 to 2016 um, was the development of the unified approach. So it was a return to then be the original task, which is then to take all these, what I thought were sort of instruments that were playing beautiful tunes on an instrument, but failing to generate the music and I then had a system that could generate the music. So then I would actually, I started to build the unified approach to psychotherapy. Now, interesting, very similar to uh, Andre Marquis, although I started initially to develop a treatment, what ultimately coalesced was a systematic approach to intervention. Okay. I, I mean, I'm sorry, assessment uh, called the well being screen and checkup system. Okay. Very similar to the integral intake. In fact, it's got, um, what it has is it's got a standardized questionnaire for the clinician, which you can then either do in a structured or semi-structured way, but basically it collects the domains that you could, and questions that you could ask about the various domains uh, that are relevant. Uh, then it has a written self-report, a qualitative self-report for the client, and it has a series of quantitative measures, okay? That essentially then yield an overall picture of well-being then assesses the specific domains of functioning, like what are your habits? Like I wanna know what your sleep patterns are, your eating, your exercise, your substance use, and your sex. What my students know is the C's analysis, okay? Uh, then I wanna understand what your emotional valence is, what your overall mood, and um, your neurotic and extroversion temperament, and the way you emotionally function, which means what emotions are hard for you and what are easy, and what's your emotional fluidity. Um, and how well can you hold emotions in what we call the sweet spot, okay? We then assess your relationship interpersonal style, like how agreeable you are uh, on a trait-based way, and what's your sense of relational value and what we call your sphere of influence across development. So we then would assess things like, well, what's your early parent relations, your early peer relations, your romantic partner developmental relations, and then where are you currently and what does that sphere of influence look like? That assesses the relationship system. We then look at your coach, uh, your coping tendencies, or your approach or avoidance coper, and what likely be the kind of psychodynamics um, indicators. People can't really report on the defenses that they use. Um, and then what are their worldviews? What, how do they think about themselves? What is their self-esteem, self-concept? So what this does is it basically then, and when we do the full one, what you would get as a as an inner from your intervention perspective is that by session four or five, you would then get a four-page write-up usually, um, that would say, here's your overall psychological well-being based on this. Here are your functioning in these different uh, domains of coping. And then we put this in a developmental narrative that thinks about biological, learning, developmental, socio-ecological context that brings you then to a person problem formulation and then sets the stage for the recommendations to then guide the intervention work. Okay. Um, so, and really this is absent in, in clinical work. There's not a comprehensive eval uh, or intake. Now, it's really fascinating that Andre's work in integral and the perspective uh, fluidity and pluralism afforded by uh, the all-qual frame gave rise to the integral intake, um, which is a beautiful assessment measure. I actually got channeled into a very similar way to develop a comprehensive uh, assessment. Uh, and then that would allow me to target and, and get on the same page if there were particular systems of adaptation at a narrow level we wanted to target, what's the overarching arc of the narrative of where they are, um, and then how will we utilize that to structure our path towards adaptive living? In uh, Wilbur's breakdown of developmental fulcrums and of the idea that there's a, a general adaptation going on in each of our maturation phases, 
the way he originally phrased it was on a sort of a narcissism to relationship dialectic, right? Not, not quite the technical definition of narcissism as a particular pathology, but in a general sense, we show up as a body and we're very absorbed into our own bodily experience. And then there's a gray area. And then hopefully we become behaviorally interactive with other bodies so that we can survive or, Fingers crossed. Right? or I'm totally absorbed in my own emotions. So then I go through a period yeah. in which I, I'm kind of confused about whose yeah. emotions are whose. And ultimately I have a, a stable relationship of emotion. So do you, do you think that's pretty accurate? Do you see something like a move from um, narcissistic absorption towards stable relationality in each of these developmental chunks? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the, the unified theory tracks and you get born as a primate. The first thing that you're tracking is through your relationship system. Okay? Uh, and your cognitive capacity basically are gonna almost experience you and mom as one thing. Okay? Um, and very quickly then the, so the tracking of the attachment relationship with mom, all pre-verbal, you know, is the process of uh, unifying, but also differentiating self and mom in relation to the extent that that harmony dance effectively happens, then you get a secure attachment, start the process of basic trust, okay, to use the Ericksonian term, or not, <laughs> all right, if you drop into not, all right, then, then as the child then moves into individuation, then by the age of two, there's both some significant potentially language, but then there really is a sense of self and relationship to other, okay? Now they're clearly, obviously very egotistically absorbed, all right? They don't have the cognitive, I was just talking about shifting frames. Two-year-olds do not really have, and two or three-year-olds, you really don't get this to four or five, even the idea that you could have different beliefs than I do. Okay? So the world just is the way I see it as, I don't have good justificatory reflection. But I am starting to develop a general sense that I'm different than mom, okay, initially. Uh, so you then have to sort of navigate that. Now, uh, what the influence matrix says is that what will start to get laid down is that the way in which you calculate this differentiation and weight the self in relationship to other is crucial, okay? If you're balanced, you'll get a good, healthy opponent process. And what that means is I respect me, <laughs> and there's some you know, people that know some background. I'm okay, and you're okay, okay? There's that quadrant, okay? Which is basically understanding some difference, healthy independence, healthy interdependence uh, in relation. I can be competitive when I need to be, and I can be friendly and giving also, if that's balance, okay? That means that what we call the green line of dependency and autonomy has a healthy opponent process around it, okay? And the power line, which is the blue line and the red line, have a healthy opponent process. Then if you have healthy opponent process with good differentiation, you get an agency communal balance, okay? Um, which actually creates an opportunity, I believe, for authentic development in relation, which is where we want to be. That's the soil uh, that you want the relationship system to be grounded out of and will grow robustly in. And that has both self and other and proper effective balance. What unfortunately happens to a lot of individuals, if you have an insecure attachment and some trauma and other kinds of things that happen and the way in which the system copes, then all of a sudden you get into the vulnerable spot, okay? The sense that I'll have low relational value, low social influence, okay? Which then causes the system to bifurcate into what I would call a defy-defer problem. The defy-defer problem is, hey, whose fault is it <laughs> that I'm in this spot, all right? And the defy is, it's you. Why, layman? Why did you treat me so goddamn unfairly? Okay. And then I'll have resentment and bitterness in relationship to it. I'll either move away from you, okay, uh, and become sort of dismissively attached, and I don't give a fuck what you say, okay? Or I'll be a mesh but hostile in relationship to you, and God damn it, you got to change, layman. You have to be different, okay? Or that's the defy, or I'll defer and be like, whatever you say, man, just let me hang out. Will you invite me back? <laughs> okay. Um, so then what you do is you sort of adopt communal, but then I just basically subjugate myself with shame and guilt, uh, put other over self, okay? So there's unhealthy communion, which is other over self, where you subjugate the self to try to maintain, to attach, you defer your own needs to the other. And then there's unhealthy counterdependency, autonomy, hostility, which is excessive self, okay? What you want is a healthy interdependent autonomous balance that's both confident and friendly. Uh, that's a much more ideal. 
but the, the whole developmental package is managing the self-other dance from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Speaking of relationships, I'm about to rupture this one. Yeah. Um, no, I really have enjoyed talking with you. I'm being called away to a, a work meeting at the moment. Okay. Um, I don't want to stop the conversation, so I just wanted to politely bow out and to thank you for letting me crash the interview. Oh, I love so talking lovely. to you, Greg, and hanging out with you, Layman, so I didn't want to miss this, but uh, um, look forward right. to well, tuning back have, in. You have healthy autonomy, and that's a healthy rupture then. <laughs> Godspeed. Godspeed, Greg. <laughs> look right. forward to hearing Wouldn't the rest of Wouldn't want to keep you I... from an academic meeting. Go! <laughs> <laughs> Now, what weird questions do I want to ask now that Bruce is gone? <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Get a rip, Layman. Yeah, spring break. <laughs> That's right. Cat's out of town. <laughs> How important is mapping in all of this? You know, like uh, like Jacques Lacan, for example, uh, has a sense in which you encounter reality, which is either too intense or too inherently self-contradictory, and you can't make a map out of it. So you deflect into imagination and symptoms and things like that. So the, the methodology there is to try to get a more realistic map of things, right? And that's, it sounds very cognitive, very computational, very intellectual in a way, but it's also easy to see how mapping might be applicable to all of these internal functions. Listen, I, yes, uh, there's two ways to respond to that. One is uh, that I think a better map, I mean, you know, you want a good map. <laughs> you know, I mean, rarely do good maps uh, are bad in and of themselves. So I think we, I, I think we, I wanted to build a better map, you know, and that's what this is in many ways, is build a better map. Um, and so my argument is that's generally a good thing. Now, some people will say, well, Jesus, Craig, you are relying on the intellect here. You're relying on the logos. An enormous number of problems come where people try to overcompensate for the logos. I mean, the whole, the whole passion of the Western mind, Tarnas's critique of modernity is like we try to jam everything into the left hemisphere and make sense out of shit. That's a reasonable critique, okay? And, and what I mean by that is a huge amount of what it is that drives us is the primate side of the equation. You know, the felt intuitive sense of self in relationship to the world, that is not amenable. It doesn't compute at the level of justification. It computes at the level of perspective, of procedural participatory knowing. Um, and these are absolutely crucial modes that we have to attend to, okay? So as a therapist, as I say, sort of my superpower, you know, I always ask therapists, hey, what's your superpower in the room, okay? Because I think you have to feel good about what your craft is and what your talent is. Um, if you're going to be a healer, I think it's crucial to me. Um, so mine is on the conceptualized psyche logos side of the equation. Like, hey, Greg will give you a hell of a conceptualization. The therapy may suck, <laughs> but this guy can actually, he'll map it out for you pretty well, uh, even as it goes bad. No, um, But so that's, that's one of the things that I, but many therapists are much more gifted at the experiential level. You know, I have a gifted therapist who, you know, work with children and dance and play scenarios, gives the opportunity for, you know, relational systems to come together, to feel of the room, um, get in touch with music and art and those kinds of elements. Um, those are real skilled and crucial parts of our psyche. Uh, so uh, I'll certainly give a nod to Ian McGilchrist and the notion that we need to be clear on who the master is uh, and how to create an embodied sense of being. Uh, and so the map bears pretty clear, it says, yep, you're doing real world work, okay? The primate body <laughs> is where a hell of a lot of the work is. And just, you know, analytically mapping it therapeutically is not that big a deal. Um, my deal is actually though for the, for the world of therapy itself and what it says for people, you know, we could do a lot better mapping of this territory than just having a bunch of people yammer about what they think is the best map all as they talk over each other. One of the things that uh, certain traditions of spirituality and certain traditions of psychotherapy have in common, it seems like building a, a richer experiential map by spending more time hanging out with particular feelings or particular symptoms or particular ambiguities, right? Like I'm going to, I'm going to sit with this for yes. a while, right? Is that, do you see that as a kind of map making? Like I'm going to get a much richer a sense of this terrain. And if I do that, somehow that's useful to me psychodynamically. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I, I really believe that the, there's an agentic core that's, uh, that, that when functions well has this coherent integrative capacity, okay? Uh, what does that look like? Well, it means that you're gonna have, I talk a lot about the emotional sweet spot, okay? V versus the neurotic loop, okay? The neurotic loop is the justifier that's like, I don't wanna feel this, this sucks, the situation sucks, and it's, it's in a defensive critical narrating position that doesn't wanna feel and see certain things in the world, okay? So then what it tries to do is it tries to avoid and control the structure of the situation. And the process by which it avoids and controls then sets the stage for them to be fundamentally disconnected and psychically at odds with whatever this thing is. Very often what will happen is this will build and build and then if it gets released, then all of a sudden they become all of it, they become overwhelmed and act impulsively on the system itself, only to convince the system, I knew I should have never felt that, <laughs> okay? So that's a mindless sort of defensive and mindless, just like it's not aware and unable to accept. A much cleaner path to coherent integration is the capacity for awareness and acceptance, okay? So that there is some perspectival and narrating center that says, oh shit, I feel this way. Mm -hmm. My wife gets annoyed at me because I'm always self-disclosing all my neurotic shit to my, to my students and our little neurotic foibles. So when you say, well, my wife and I were fighting the other day. So I'm like, Jesus, God, you know, like, what are you doing? And part of the whole point is that I want to show people that I can shine the light on the various aspects of my real world, you know, and that it's hard at times. But the center point wants to be able to hold, be aware of and attuned to the system and also know how to adaptively regulate it, right? And that part of that means being able to be detached. Part of that means like knowing what the long-term and short-term consequences are, a lot of self-determined discipline, all of that. So fundamentally, this could, if we say, yeah, to pay attention, to stay with that, that shine in the light and being aware of and attuned to some of your feelings, and the ability to stay with that and have resilience and staying with that without being forced to act on it. I mean, that's the emotional sweet spot. That's one of the central adaptive capacities that we look at. Greg, should I be um, owning and expressing my emotions or does that risk cultivating the very emotions that I'm expressing? And I should instead be practicing the kinds of emotions and thought patterns that I wish to have. <laughs> <laughs> right, brilliant. Um, so that's a, that's a very good, uh, so the first thing is don't think about it like a recipe. Think about it as principles and processes. Okay. So I, I'm not big on recipes, but I'm big on principles and processes. So uh, one of the thing, one of the principles and processes that we were just be aware of and attuned and have capacity to stay present with, but not be overwhelmed by emotion. So that's one deal. Okay. At the same time, Think about what you, what is your valued states of being and what kinds of, you know, I, the emotions generally are not shot after outcomes that you then preordain. So I want to be happy is a very, is not the right frame. Okay. You want to be successful and fulfilled <laughs> and then be clear about what that means. And guess what? Your system will be like, all right, I'm loving this. <laughs> I'm a happy camper because I'm successful and fulfilled. Okay. So understanding emotions as signals as various aspects about needs and goals and things like that. Okay. Recognizing your capacity to be in touch with them. If you are of course finding yourself like way more depressed and anxious than you want to be, you know, then the first thing is, well, what is the, uh, what is it a symptom of in terms of my soul? Like how depressed and anxious do you want to be given how life is? If life sucks, you want to be kind of depressed and anxious. That's proper alignment. I always ask my students and my clients, I was like, well, how depressed do you want to be? And they're like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, you just said you were lonely. You had no friends and life sucks. So I, that, that sounds like pretty damn depressed as far as I would be. Okay. It's like, well, I thought depression was my problem. It's like, no, the depression's a symptom if life sucks, you know, at one level. Now, at the same time, we can feel depressed and then get reciprocal narrating, hijack our justifications and be like, well, I'll never get better. My whole life sucks and I'm worthless. And then feed that back into your emotion system so you only feel worse. Now that's what we call the neurotic loop where the feeling system hijacks aspects of your doing and thinking system and then creates a very vicious cycle. So that's absolutely possible. Then you can sort of be, you're neurotically depressed which means it's maladaptive. 
then you would say, hey, you know, this is not helping me and have the value that you may want to be different. Then there would be ways in which you could relate to yourself, your situation differently, track your different feelings, see if you can cultivate them, do certain things. Like for example, gratitude. We know that gratitude is a particular kind of emotion that's often underdeveloped. Um, so you can create gratitude exercises if your heart really felt them. You can't just bullshit yourself. But you can train yourself to engage in certain kinds of things, open yourself up to modes of being in the world uh, that may really afford you a particular signal of the environment that's more the way you want to be. And if you do that, that would be an authentic way of transforming your emotional function. I think you, you've partly answered the question that makes me want to ask this question, uh, which is you're not a recipe guy, you're a principles and processes guy. What are, the, what are some of the general principles and processes that overall uh, inculcate psychological well-being? If, if you were the next Jordan Peterson and you're writing Greg's Six Rules for Life, what are they? <laughs> Woohoo! Oh man, you got my ego going, please. <laughs> um, so let's just talk about sort of on the, there's the healthy structural functioning side of the equation. So what does it look like? What does this healthy structural functioning system look like? Well, these are called systems of adaptation because they say something about the agent arena flow, the structure and function of flow across development, okay? And one of the first things I look for is, well, hey, how healthy is that? What's the emotional system? What's its valence and how's it processing? and more directly, the real relationship system, okay? So one structural relation is how, where's that relationship's history in terms of, is it felt known and valued? How were injuries dealt with, okay? What is that, what's the residue of that? But you basic, one principle is, it's damn well better be known and valued. <laughs> principle one, be known and valued. <laughs> okay. and, that would be, and that may sound funny, but it's actually a message to society which says we want to create a culture that maximizes the experience in which people are likely to feel known and valued. Okay, so that's what the rules for society, number one. And by the way, a capital labor society instrumentalizes people and orients them towards social influence, which is related but different than no relational value. And we may find ourselves on the wrong metric there. People will be more thinking about manipulation rather than actual connection. And that's going to be a big difference. Okay, so relational value is absolutely central. The process by which one justifies one's feelings and relations to oneself and to others. We want, um, we want a sensitive system that's relative, but also one that fosters robustness and resilience, both vertically across the stack of the individual and horizontally between people. Okay? So how do we understand dynamics of justification? What does it mean about influence? How do we metabolize uh, that? And then, you know, the, then, the, so that's this sort of what does optimal functioning tend to look like? Well, those are some of the basic psychological ingredients we could get then into, well, and how do you cultivate a particular move towards more fulfillment up the stack of, say, spiritual elements? Then we go into, well, well, what are the basic issues that when you start to have problems, how do we cultivate the way to think about those problems from a principle and process way? And that's this the eighth branch on the tree is the calm MO frame of reference, okay? And that's the integrative approach to psychological mindfulness um, that says that you're gonna get conflict and tension, and, but if you're not attentive to it, if you're mindlessly reactive, that makes you vulnerable to vicious maladaptive cycles that drive you further and further into dis, you know, distress because you won't get your needs met. The calm MO model basically says bring awareness and acceptance Okay, a metacognitive observer that then is informed by being curious and open as opposed to say critical and closed, that is accepting and brings an attitude of acceptance rather than resistance or rejection, that is loving, compassionate rather than hostile and contemptuous, and that's motivated toward values states of being rather than helpless and hopeless. Okay. So those, the attitude of calm basically are the core principles and processes that you bring to bear when conflict and maladaptive cycles begin to emerge and how to pause those maladaptive cycles through this mindfulness and then set up a context in which you would reverse them to more adaptive processes. Nice. 
Um, I heard somewhere, uh, um, there's a couple of organizations where people have come up with new ways to create uh, interesting brain scan technologies, and they've tried to promote these. And I heard a guy who ran a corporation like this say of psychologists and psychiatrists, it's the only branch of medicine where they don't want to see the organ that they study. <laughs> he gets tremendous pushback from a lot of people involved in psychotherapy. Uh, do you think adequate use of brain scans uh, are being made in, uh, you know, the fields of psychiatry and psychology? Or should we be looking more? Obviously, we're not reducing everything to just the brain because there's a broader behavioral context. But are we looking enough at what the brain's doing or are we over relying on verbal communication from patients? Right. That's a great question. Um, so the first thing that I would say is I am uh, ultimately a natural behavioralist. And what I mean by that is that really science is properly conceptualized as a behavioral um, ontology as opposed to a physicalist ontology. Our obsession with, on the critical side, the obsession with brain gets us confused between what is a physicalist ontology, oh, that must be the source of all of your behavior, and behavioral ontology, which puts the whole thing as, yes, this is a conversation, okay? And quite frankly, I don't know how much I need of your brain to have this conversation with you. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can show me lots of different brain pictures. I mean, I don't know which one's layman, but I know layman. We had a great conversation. In fact, maybe the greatest ever. <laughs> okay. So, you know, so yes, uh, I would, I, what I would say is, yeah, the brain's an unbelievably important organ, but on my system, that's the seventh floor of analysis. Okay. This conversation takes place at the 11th floor. And as a psychotherapist, that's what I'm interested in. I mean, the person, the behavior of the person as a whole is actually what I'm interested in, okay? Now the brain can tell me about that domain, absolutely. And we've learned, you know, most, I would say, actually, we know most of the brain through behavior rather than brain, <laughs> brain doesn't teach us about behavior. <laughs> behavior teaches us about brain much more than the reverse. But nonetheless, a mature science will in invariably be consiliently organized by the brain and uh, by brain knowledge and be effectively networked in relationship to brain knowledge. Our increasing awareness of the brain and hopefully psychological theories will give us more and more better and better and better mapping about that. And to the extent that we then get brain technology that's accessible, then that would be wonderful. The reason from my vantage point that it's not been that crucial, although I actually ran a study with a um, biofeedback thing called heart math, Okay, which I actually was very impressed by, and I've been impressed by a number of biofeedback. Basically, this was, you loaded it onto your computer. It came with some technology where it tested your blood pressure um, and heart rate, and then you tracked your biofeedback on a computer and then were engaged in various processes in relation. So that was a biophysiological behavioral feedback process. It was really fascinating, okay? Now, that was tracking the whole body through a couple of key metrics. Um, the issue with brain, at least right now, brain imaging, of course, as you know, um, any decent brain imaging requires you to jam the person inside a big, uh, at least up until the last decade, at least, um, was unbelievably expensive where you had to be static and you sit inside a magnet or whatever for a long period of time and you're not active moving around and not engaged and stuff. Uh, for the psychotherapeutic problem, uh, that's not super efficient and effective. What exactly those lit up brain areas actually mean is very debatable. I do believe, however, a consilient view of brain with uh, and psychology uh, will be really powerful. Um, for example, the predictive processing stuff that we're seeing by like Carl Friston, which I think is also syncing up with people, uh, neuroscientists, psychologists like Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, we'll be, we will build a model of the brain as a dynamic, complex connectome system that will blend seamlessly into our models of psychological behavior. The more tight knit we get on that and the more effective our brain technologies are in tracking that, um, I feel that that would give a much more powerful tool. Um, so I'm for it in the future, but I would say that um, I have a, I'm not of the opinion that the psychologists have been you know, just woefully ignorant about the brain and, and turn their head out of the way, given that where technologies and knowledge are, you now there's just too much richness in behavior and too much limitation and vulnerability to physical reductionism. I think we've erred, certainly psychiatry's erred on the side of neurobiological reductionism more than neglecting that, that's for sure.
Uh, you talked about um, an agentic function in the psyche, which organizes or leases itself out to other <laughs> aspects to create some kind of increasingly general, increasingly abstract, agentic comprehension of the unit. Uh, one of the things that seems like it goes along with agency for me is the notion of will and intention. So I'm curious what your take on that is, because I know there are types of therapeutic methodologies like voluntary exposure, where voluntary is really an important piece of that. Otherwise, you're not getting re-traumatized because you said yes to it. You invoked your agentic-like will. So how much of a role does will play in therapy? That's crucial, 100%. Uh, will is a complicated term. I don't use will all that much, but I certainly... I mean, it's, it's an old term, and of course, we can get into what free will debate very quickly, and I'm happy to narrate on that. Um, for me, uh, it's a central question that frames psychotherapy in the sense that I am not a fan of mandated psychotherapy. I don't even like um, assessments for institutions that are for the institution as opposed to for the individual. So um, I tell all my students right up the bat that I am looking, you know, I generally work with voluntary therapy where the individual at least has some modicum of self-determination that brings them into the door and some desiring of this process for their own information and betterment. And if you don't have that, some, that when you have all these secondary contingencies that might be driving either mandated therapy or if they get some diagnosis, they then get some secondary gain through some assessment protocols or things along those lines, um, you get a very, very different uh, relationship to the process. Uh, so I am very much for trying to cultivate the ego self-consciousness system that says, hey, I have, I have some problems at some level. I may not know what they are, but I want to get a better narrative of why I'm having difficulty, what my history is, and what I can do about it for me. Uh, and not in an overly egoic way, but that the will is organized and directed in this as opposed to some secondary uh, frame of mind. I see that as absolutely crucial. Uh, hell, even when you have that, people will be a lot of resistance and stuckness and be like, I don't really want to give up my eating or my alcohol or my neurotic ways of being with my wife. I like that shit when I realize it. I'm like, well, yeah, Marty, you definitely will. Um, so it's hard enough to get the, you know, to have the egoic will try to overcome real change and really break through uh, some of the old uh, sort of attractor states that somebody has embedded in. Um, but I, I see that as an overarching central aspect the therapy is completely different if you have a mandated aspect or a lot of other things that might be secondarily driving it. So uh, at that level, I don't know if that is, gets right at the question you were asking, but that my first response is that. An interesting thing about psychology is trying to figure out whether it's working or not, right? You know, how do we know someone's doing okay? And so it's like a negative take where you can say, uh, there's an absence of symptoms or, right, the patient is not complaining, yeah, <laughs> problem right. solved. Yeah. Uh, or there's a positive version, which like, um, like a Maslow thing that he kind of right. inherits from Nietzsche, which is if people are doing all right, then they're going to be regularly having peak experiences of some mm -hmm. kind. <laughs> so what's your take on, on both the negative and the positive style of evaluating whether psychology is working? Totally. Well, certainly our field has generally been absence of symptoms means it worked. So uh, virtually all outcomes up until 1990s and still 95% of, well, what's your score on a Beck depression inventory? Uh, what's your score on a generalized anxiety? What's your score here? And that's really in research. Virtually everybody else in the practice world is how you doing? Are you happy? And things getting better? And so you get this very, very um, it's a murky thing, uh, and I don't want to minimize that because really what we are interested in is the subjective experience of being. It's a lot different, you know, when, a, when psychotherapy, you say it's really working, and then some cancer patient says, I think this is working. It's like, well, <laughs> I want to look. <laughs> but here, if you're really, if you're authentic and, and you don't have any reason for uh, doubting that, and the person is relatively healthy to report that this is working, um, that carries a lot of value. Um, so the... the the issue for me um, is that there are a couple of principles, there are outcome and four principles that psychotherapists should be aware of. And there should be some basic sense of the prognosis of the relationship. Like how does the relationship deepening? What's the feel of the relationship? What's working there or not, okay? Are there ruptures that didn't get repaired? What is that quality? Uh, a psychotherapeutic relationship should be, you know, 
something that has the capacity to handle ruptures and then are repaired, has a sense that the individual likes and is trusted, that's crucial. And then also has a sense that progress is being made toward positive goals, like, hey, I'm learning this skill, I'm learning this issue, I'm getting, I'm working through some of my old issues and a reduction of some of the problems. So both of those should be considered. Um, I also think in our overall uh, sense, that the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, built as it is off of medicine, too much is about just the absence of pathology, okay, is the thing. They don't have a really clear frame of reference of what, what's optimal functioning. It's a transpersonal, uh, humanistic uh, frame of reference. Uh, there's a psychodynamic model of uh, the psychodynamic diagnostic model. Um, that's a book on, and it starts with a much richer articulation of what is a psychologically healthy person, somebody, you know, who can, is ri live rich in full lives, has full access to their affect, can reflect on their neurotic tendencies, understands how to handle disappointments. Um, you know, they have a whole list and they give, here's a robust, healthy individual who's, say, you know, spiritually enlightened, broadly defined, who has good relationships, who can manage disappointments in particular kinds of ways. So this is what optimal functioning is. And we should have a model of what optimal functioning is that, that is talked about more. Um, I find my students, one of, one of the most difficult things for them to realize is that when they evaluate somebody's listening, how do they understand, what reference do they use functionality? Like, how do you know, you know, they just just sort of describe some comment, you know, it's like, well, my dad was sort of critical and I was really upset about it. And then, you know, often there's like, well, how do I alleviate their upsetness? Okay. And I'm always like, well, wait a minute. First, we want to understand the functionality of this exchange. What is the relationship that this uh, son has with father? What's father's attitude here? How sophisticated was this exchange? How upset should they be based on where they are on the functional continuum of psychosocial engagement? Obviously, if the dad's like, well, you've always been a fucking failure, you know, grow up. And that was the it. It was like, oh my God, that's really dysfunctional. If they had a hard conversation where dad was holding him accountable to something that he had let himself down on and let the family down on in an authentic way and he was feeling stressed and criticized about that, well, that may be exactly how he should be feeling, right? So we need the system as a clinical psychology far too often have been focused on distress and dysfunction and not differentiated what are symptoms and causes and hasn't given us a clear optimal mo model of what human psychosocial functioning is that we can actually effectively reference as opposed to some just vague, normal, asymptomatic person. It's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and I'm like, how's that a reference point? And that's, that we have way too often operated off of the absence of that frame. In physical medicine, there's a set of uh, typologies, right? There's a half a dozen blood types. There's three types of gut bacteria, ecosystems, things like that. Typology in psychology um, seems much more ambiguous. I think it's the most under-theorized major element of the integral model. Uh, we have the horoscope, the Enneagram, and Myers-Briggs, roughly speaking. <laughs> And none of them are as high as we would like in terms of predictive accuracy and utility. On the other hand, psychology has been patting itself on the back for a few years about finally condensing traits down into the big five, yep. uh, which is a great achievement. How much of typology is really just combinations of the big five traits? And to what degree are there types of people? That's a great question. Um, uh, and it's a great, it's a great, uh, well, it's a great theoretical question. Uh, so, and it really depends on how you, you know, you frame it. Here's what I'll say is not a good model in my estimation. Dichotomized typologies that basically are where somebody is, yes, all of that and no, all of that or vice versa, okay? So that, there are virtually no frames of reference in my estimation where you can flip switches and say, oh, somebody is just one type or another with no continuity in between, okay? So that's bad. However, there are absolutely types that can emerge that you can think about things typologically in particular kinds of ways. Uh, and, and the big five can grant you some of these kind of languages and, and it really depends on how you wanna frame and think about them. So for example, um, well, let's just take, if we take the big five and look at what I would call the real indicators of the base of the emotional system, OK? 
okay? Um, a little into the relational system, but mostly the indicators of the base of the emotional system on the big five are on the one hand, neuroticism, okay? Which essentially is how the development of an individual emerges in adolescence so that you create a set point of negative affectivity, all right? And then you're idling at a set point of negative affectivity, which basically means how reactive are you are to stress, how intensive is that reaction, how long does it last, how difficult is it to get you back to baseline. Then you have extroversion, which is how, how po much positive energy and social gregariousness is, does the system idle at, okay? So now let's then say, okay, what would it be if you were high extroverted and low neurotic? Well, this is like a dispositional well-being. It's easygoing, friendly, positive, and let shit non-reactive to stress. That's, and we can certainly use both of those to predict um, uh, hedonic tone and well-being very strongly. And then you flip it around and what if you were high neurotic, low extroverted, you'd be shy, hypersensitive, negative, you know, worried all the time dispositionally. So high, low being, well below being, temperamental structures and oh, you're hot, you're an e you know, you'd be an easygoing kid that goes off into high well-being type versus a hypersensitive reactive kid that goes into low well-being type. That's, that's real, <laughs> you know, the, and certainly, the, you know, you can, and you can then do uh, there's even more interesting areas in typology and big five recently in 2017, I think it was, they did a massive study on patterns in the big five and identified that there's a role model personality, which I actually theorized would be the case, um, which was low neuroticism and then moderate to high agreeableness, extroversion, conscientiousness, and openness. And about 20 to 25% of the people have that profile which they call role model, which is enormously more than what you would expect if it was all just random, okay? So that does suggest a constellation tendency. Now, I think it's of an overall general adaptation model. Like there's a system of general. So you then think about what the reverse of that is, high neuroticism, moderately low all the others. <laughs> you get a shit show, a shit show personality, right? <laughs> Sorry, but you know, there it is. Um, so, so you definitely can use dimensions and do, and do it in relationship to types. And you can see really interesting polarities emerge. Um, I did a blog, if we then shift into like personality dysfunction, there's clearly layering of personality that you can do all the way from, you know, borderline into neurotic and into uh, healthy. But then as people get defensive and then they get channeled into particular ways, they're definitely different polarizing types that are radically different. So for example, a narcissistic type is totally different, almost polar opposite than an avoidant type. And, and they deal with power relations in radically different. Narcissists, actively competitive, fuck you, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna be you know, uh, completely uh, one over, uh, self over other in a win, you know, lose frame. The avoidant type's completely reversed. I'm, sh I'm self-conscious, I'm deferential, I submit, I run away. Um, those, and those structures would be radically different. Uh, Trump is not an avoidant personality <laughs> at any level, okay? So there are lots of different ways to, to frame that. Uh, I think that there are clusters of dimensions that can get polarized. If we do Myers-Briggs, um, I, I, first off, Myers-Briggs, I think, focuses more on conscious uh, attention and it's, and it's organization, and it's a very different thing than like the big five, so they're, they're different elements. But my wife and I are pretty much opposites. You know, I'm an INTJ. She's an S, you know, CFP, whatever. Um, and man, if you know that, you can see the way we process information, what we tend to in the environment is radically different. Um, but I would argue that, yeah, it's better to think about those as clusters of dimensions, generally, uh, on continuums rather than uh, strong typology. Uh, so it's a it, the type, strong typologies are hard cases to make, but the utility of typologies around different constellations of dimensions, that to me is a, is a valid, valid way of approaching. Yeah, I think we've, uh, we've done top-down typology too much over human history. We've got to sort of build it up from clusters. <laughs> right. right. Uh, we're coming along in two hours, yeah. so I've only got a couple of questions left. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, that, it flies by with you, friend, every time. I'm always like, hey, that was 10 minutes. No, that was a half an hour. I'm like, oh, my, my inner clock is way off when I'm hanging with layman. <laughs> there's, a, mm, uh, there's a common motif in spiritual practice of striving to be a, 
a person full of equanimity and tranquility, right? The sattvic personality. And that can emerge more or less spontaneously as a person matures, but it can also be a kind of defensive strategy to avoid being emotionally excited by things. Totally. I'm curious about the element of excitement. You've mentioned a few times, if a person's upset, you want to say to them, well, what's your situation? Maybe you should be upset. Right? As you know, I'm, I'm uh, quite interested in the work of Wilhelm Reich and the idea that we even physiologically try to inhibit the amount of stimulation that's going on in the organism. Uh, and that that's at the root of a lot of our pathological manifestations. Yes. So uh, how important is it for people to be able to uh, let go of self-calming <laughs> mm. and allow themselves to experience the degree of stimulation that's actually going on in them? Yeah, totally. Right. I, I think that the, you want to, first off, different people have different set points for their uh, you know, where they are stimulation wise and good to know then what is comfortable on the one hand and where you kind of want to be. Okay. So somebody like Jordan Peterson, I mean, he's obviously dispositionally neurotic, defensive, depressed. I mean, you know, that's it. He deals with depression a lot and he's going to be driven to see the, you know, the atrocities of humanity and he's deep and conscientious and thoughtful and everything, but that's going to then drive his soul in a particular way to be concerned about the world in a particular way and express it that way. And I think that some degree of alignment with where your temperamental disposition is and where you find yourself on the, you know, panoply of spectrums of individual differences. And we need all of those voices. Okay. So we don't want to say everyone should idle here in relationship to excitability or calmness, neuroticism or extroversion. They're different systems for good individual different reasons that actually probably operate at a population level that are allowing us to see and experience the world in different ways. If we think like it's all part of a global collective intelligence, you want some people going neurotically, like we're going to kill the planet, you know, and other people, ah, be all right. You know, that could be good opponent process. So you then want to see where your heart tends to be in relation. Obviously, if you are, to me, neuroticism isn't just the negative affect. It's the fundamental sensitivity that then drives you into maladaptive ways too. So, you don't want to be in a neurotic maladaptive patterns. That's what psychotherapy is for. That means basically the way you're adjusting drives things to make things worse. So you, to bottom line is, is that we want, I would think that you want more or less full awareness of various possible <laughs> affective experiences that different people will have different dispositions, extroverted neuroticism disposition about where they would tend to, to be. No one should be fixed rigidly, I mean, uh, the full human experience affords all sorts of different elements, but people will settle at various places. Right? Don't try to force yourself, know where your bottom-up tendency is, know where your values are, and then try to bring them in proper uh, harmonious alignment. Nice. Who, who are your psychology heroes? And, and I mean that in two senses, like mm -hmm. earlier on in your life, who made you think psychology was a good way to go? Who, who got you excited about it? And also now looking back, who do you find is um, an ever fertile source of ideas on the subject that you can go back to and always realize, oh, they were really onto something. <laughs> right, right. That's a really good question. So first off, I would say that the, uh, I was fascinated just by the field itself. I always had sort of an ecumenical view of the field. Um, I didn't have, and maybe that's, you know, reflective about what happened to me, you know, I, I didn't have any field that I, aspect that I was completely thinking of dominant. I was, I was impressed by science and empiricism. Um, I really like, you know, Albert Bandura, he sort of stood out as sort of a social cognitive, very, you know, I do, gr I do drift towards the egoic rationalist, clearly, you know, I have a, a garden, not the dragon behind it, you know, I'm, I'm definitely in sort of like the how to be realistically, optimistically oriented in a positive way. That's my disposition. So I look for sort of, uh, you know, good, strong, solid thinkers that, uh, that also are deep, that some people would think are a little conventional, but that's where my original, you know, sort of mainstream. Um, I was uh, moved by Rogers uh, and shifted from the, I had some really experiences with some real humanistic people and shifted and had some lousy experience with some cognitive behavioral people in early graduate school. And then grew into the realization that the human relationship is key. I got impressed by some of his early 
work. I love the idea of an organismic valuing process. I will say that all good therapy really starts with Rogers as far as I'm concerned. So psychotherapy, um, the behaviors and psychoanalysts, you know, did all sorts of interesting things, but really psychotherapy for me, it's Carl Rogers is the ground of the best psychotherapy. Um, and the, mis the, the humanistic message of that to try to create a context in which each individual in the relational world has the capacity to identify their, you know, relational value, what I, you know, their heartfelt organismic valuing process and to grow in that regards is very, very meaningful to me. I then went off and then worked with, you know, Beck uh, at his lab and I was been impressed with just sort of the, um, the stoicism. I like I liked the cognitive behavioral stoic view uh, in relation. Um, and then later I got hooked into the psychoanalytic people. I mean, I then returned back uh, to what they would have to offer. Uh, I was originally, I, I learned sort of the empirical thumb your nose up at cognitive, that's psychoanalysis, that's not real science. You know, what the hell are those guys doing? And then you circle back and you're like, oh my God, we didn't know what we're, we were doing if I'm on team science first, so that's a problem. <laughs> and then you really look at sort of what Freud did in terms of the legacy. I mean, nobody left a, a bigger, more impactful legacy uh, than he did. And quite frankly, over the last three or four years, well, I have people like John Verveke coming up in my, now, you know, kind of my, you know, colleague hero and the stuff that you guys are doing on the integral stage. And I have come to over the last two years, three years, a return to Wilbur, who I was a little critical of originally in terms of the spiritual ontology and now find myself much more um, appreciative of his view and what uh, I feel much more affinity to a unified integral bridging than I might have in like 2005. So. Uh, it's a long-winded answer, but I got lots of multiple sort of <laughs> partial heroes that I try to integrate together. <laughs> That's great. I really, uh, there's a certain sense of a person you only get by hearing about the constellation of people that stimulate them. Mm -hmm. Last and question. And I now consider you a, one of my constellation of people that stimulate oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> All right. What sorts of things are you predominantly seeing in terms of practice over the years? And do you think that the people that you've dealt with professionally are, are a reasonable sample of what's going on in our culture right now? And have you seen the trends change over the years in terms of what people are struggling with psychologically? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that there certainly is a sense. My primary focus Based on, I mean, I got a lot of different exposure to psychotherapy up until I came to University, uh, James Madison University in 2003. So I was in prison, I was in counseling center. Uh, the four years I worked at Beck was, um, I was running a suicide attemptor study predominantly and also running a cognitive therapy for psychosis study. So in those contexts, I'm working in the middle, in the bottom of, of Philadelphia. <laughs> Okay, so hang out at the bottom, mean streets of Philadelphia, people killing themselves, trying to kill themselves and engaged in psychotic process. Uh, so that's one world. Um, and uh, I will say I did a study that compared our 2000 world to the, when Beck had started to do a similar project in 1970. And I, I published that in Psychological Psychiatric Medicine. Um, one of the most important empirical findings, empirical findings I've made and man, the psychopathology over that time period had dramatically worsened. Uh, uh, people we were seeing at the bottom of the Philadelphia barrel in 2000 were significantly worse in 1970. That means their, their scores on helplessness, hopelessness, their substance use, their legal problems, their difficulties with uh, suicidal behavior. So, so that, was, that was like, ooh, that's not good. Okay. Now fat jump forward to where I've been focused mostly on uh, you know, I'm doing my massive theory thing, and then I'm trying to develop the generalized approach uh, to, you know, what walks in the door in outpatient psychotherapy, which is uh, the cluster of internalizing conditions, okay? Uh, we're seeing this now in overall, when they do uh, sort of studies, uh, there's a high top, which is a hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology. We're doing meta-analyses on all the symptoms. And you're really seeing a cluster of symptoms uh, that is that drives people's psychotherapy, the internalizing cluster. It's low self-esteem, low life satisfaction, uh, and depression, anxiety, basically. Um, 
I, I looking now at the college student population that the numbers of individuals that are having problems in that area, I think have substantially expanded. Okay. So um, I think a reasonable estimate that when I went to college in the 1980s, at any particular time, who, what percentage of people were clinically impaired, okay, uh, would be like warrant a neurotic diagnosis at that moment and go to psychotherapy was about one in 10. Right now, you could argue it's one in three. Okay. Um, so that's a 300% increase. All right. Now, I think if you say, well, people are a lot more willing to report and they're a lot less self-conscious and actually they're almost rewarded by saying you have anxiety and depression. So there's a cohort effect and there's other things, but you control for some of that. I'm convinced that we are seeing a college student mental health crisis, okay? Uh, where you get substantial worsening of symptoms. What am I seeing in relationship to that? I'm seeing that A, um, I, I wrote about this in several blogs. Um, I think that individuals are more sort of fragmented and stressed. Okay, so I was like, I have to do this, I have to do this. And these are externalized standards that they haven't really ingrained. They're just what you're supposed to do to keep up with the Joneses. Okay, they're distributed across a wide variety of different domains with just a performance indicator of I have to do them because that's what all my friends are doing. So there's this sense of sort of shallow, I need to do this because I need to do this because this is what everybody does. And it's fragmented and, and intense. So meaning that it's always, there's, it's always the pressure. You always have the phone. So that's one. Second, the sense that negative emotions are bad. Okay, it's like, um, like get rid of them. I don't, I should be happy. I don't wanna have them rather than they're a signal of something. So people, and this then also connects to an absence of a philosophy of life, a deep meaning making system that says, oh, you know, I know how to make sense out of the human condition and my life in relationship to it. So if you don't have a, a and, and by the way, they're also been raised where, you know, everything's a microaggression. You know, it's like, oh my God, you have no idea how oppressive you've been. And it's like, well, no, I didn't. Now I know, you know, and I'm, I'll make fun of the hyper progressive angle there, but this is a, Jonathan Haidt talked about bubble wrapping our children. Um, the bubble wrap of mentality, listen, I'm a parent of three kids. I don't want my kids hurt, but if you overprotect, you basically create hypersensitive reactivity. So I see individuals who are hypersensitive, they're neurotically reactive, they externalize their negative affect, like I shouldn't have this. They don't know how to integrate with it. They don't know effectively cope. Their distributed cognition is way out here and they're not guided by a philosophy of life. And you know that makes the neurotic and socially awkward individuals really vulnerable to falling in cracks. And I think the size of that crack has gone from maybe one in 10 to maybe one in four, one in three individuals. And that's tragic because it means that a hell of a lot more people are spinning neurotic wheels um, than, you know, that's a lot of suffering, uh, unnecessary suffering. So there's a lot of people who need a more authentic sense of how to move through life that isn't superficial, fragmented, and socially assumed. There's a lot of people who need a better relationship and appreciation for the utility of negative emotions. And there's a lot of people who need a coherent uh, way of making sense of life and its purpose. It's almost like we'd have a religion in the 21st century that could bring people <laughs> together and afford them a capacity of four souls, Layman. That's, I can see it. Seems to be my <laughs> almost. I don't know if that resonates with you. <laughs> Not my my metapsychological <laughs> diagnosis is kind of that. I don't want to urge society in any particular direction. But, uh... I don't know. You know, let me list it out. You know, what the, the doctor did not say take two pills. You know, call me in the morning. The meta psychologist says, oh, maybe we need a different kind of communal living. <laughs> oh, this has been great, Greg. Thanks very much. Great insights into the field. Thank you so much. I really appreciate coming on and sharing this. And uh, uh, love to have that Andre's going to come. And oh, he's, he's a longtime friend of mine. And I find in these, like I said, these connections between unified and integral um, are very fulfilling. And uh, so I appreciate brilliant questions and really enjoy them.